Well, welcome back wherever you are in the world. And I've just been told that there are people registered for this conference in 99 countries around the world. So that's pretty impressive. I don't know whether you're all online now, but we know we've got uh, several hundred watching. So um, wonderful to not see you, but know that you're with us. Um, we are talking here about the role of online marketplaces in protecting and empowering digital consumers. It's something that we touched upon in the first session, of course, but we're going to really dive a little bit deeper into this whole issue of e-commerce, because we know that there's been this explosion in the use of online marketplaces uh, during COVID. Lots of benefits for consumers, but we also want to look at the role of the marketplaces themselves in protecting consumers when we're talking about unsafe products and scams, unfair or misleading conduct, all sorts of issues that affect consumers. Remember, please do send us your questions via the Q&A, um, and we will also be asking you some questions in a poll, so we'll tell you some more about that, just to get a sense of what you're thinking. Before I introduce the panelists, please let me uh, introduce though, our first keynote speaker. So we are delighted to have with us Commissioner Akiko Ito, who heads the Consumer Affairs Agency in Japan. And just hear a little bit about the legislative developments in Japan relating to online marketplaces. Good afternoon, Mebrian. I am Akiko Ito, Commissioner of the CAA, Consumer Affairs Agency of Japan. It is a great honor for me to have this opportunity today. First of all, I'd like to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the 50th anniversary of the OECD Committee on Consumer Policy. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the society, accelerating the digital transformation. In Japan, in order to lead a nationwide digitalization, the government plans to launch a new national organization, Digital Agency. In power, the government is not tackling issues related to digital platforms in order to ensure market competition and protect consumers by regulating the activities of digital platforms. From the competition point, policy point of view, the new act, which came into effect last February, regulates the relationship between large platform providers and business users. From the consumer protection point of view, taking into account a rapid increase in consumer affairs consultation related to the online marketplace, which is becoming a vital tool for consumer life, we have been taking two legislative approaches. Firstly, we amended the existing act to introduce more severe punishment for deceiving consumers in e-commerce. Secondly, we passed a new act this April, the scope of which covers all digital platforms, regardless of business size, products, and services. The new act sets out new obligations and rights. Firstly, the obligations for digital platforms to endeavor to take consumer protection measures, such as investigation in case of consumer complaints and identity confirmation of sellers. Secondly, the right reserved to the CAA to request the digital platform to take necessary measures, such as removing unsafe goods and services from their sites. Thirdly, the consumer's right to request information disclosure on business users to digital platforms. To conclude, in order to maximize benefits of digitalization for consumers, it is essential to create safe and secure environment for online transactions. We will continue to make further efforts to protect consumers. As we face the same challenges globally, it will be important and helpful to exchange views with you and to enhance international cooperation. We hope the CCP will have much more success in the years to come. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much indeed to Commissioner Ito and really interesting to hear about getting tough in Japan on the, the, the platforms, including more severe penalties. So let me now introduce our panel for this session. We start with Dr. Christine 
Rifa, who is a reader in law at Brunel University in London, specializing in consumer e-commerce and new tech law, and also serves on the United Nations Working Group on Consumer Protection in e-commerce. Welcome to you. We also have with us Niels Bent, who is acting deputy director general in DG Justice and Consumers at the European Commission, also still director of consumers, so in charge of developing the European consumer policy, not single-handed, I think, Niels, but <laughs> you're in charge. Um, Carletta Uten is Amazon's Vice President for Product Assurance, Risk and Security, so all about establishing global standards and policies and uh, managing emerging risk and issues. So it'd be very interesting to hear your take on what we're talking about today. Christian Prinzel Halverson, CEO of Finn.no. Um, although it's called Finn, it is actually Norwegian, uh, Norwegian marketplace site, website. Um, and you're also European VP for Nordic Marketplaces for Shipstead, which is the media group and now classified marketplace site group. So it's, a, it's quite a big group. I saw on your, your CV that you started programming computers when you were eight, which I think is pretty impressive. I don't know whether there's anyone can beat you on that, but it was very impressive. James Kirkham, uh, General Counsel at the Catch Group, which operates catch.com.au, one of Australia's largest online marketplace platforms, which launched in 2017. And you um, have led the creation of Catch Group's product safety and compliance function uh, across the whole of the group portfolio. So welcome to you again, and, and somebody else staying up very late to be with us. So we're very grateful. And a bit closer to home or from where I am, because I'm in Brussels, Monique Goins, who is the Director General of BEUC, the European Consumer Organization, representing 45 national consumer associations, 32 European countries. And also Monique is the current EU co-chair of the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, which is a network of EU and US consumer organizations. And the person who is going to be moderating this is Andrew Hadley. And he is Assistant Director of Policy and International in the Office of the General Counsel at the United Kingdom Competition and Markets Authority. A very long title, Andrew, but you've been there for more than 20 years. Uh, and I know that you're involved in all sorts of uh, other elements of consumer protection, including the OECD Consumer Committee. Um, so I am going to hand it over to you. And as last time, I will come in at the end and we will look at Josh's uh, artistry that uh, he's going to be summing up in pictures, and I will just do a bit of summer in words. So, Andrew. Thank you very much, Cathy, and um, it's a it's a real treat um, to, to be here today. I'm delighted to be working with such a distinguished and expert panel and incredibly impressed with the um, attendance so far and all of the, the new um, techniques that people are, are using, the, uh, the, the sketching, the, the questions. So please um, hope you can stay with us. Um, please do put your questions into, uh, into the chat. We'll come to those at the end. Um, even if we can't take the questions, I think the panel will be very interested to hear and see what, um, what other issues people are, are interested in and it will form part of the record. So very much encourage you to, um, to put those questions in. Um, so we're, we're going to build a bit more on the, the market trends discussion that we had uh, in the previous session and to focus a bit more on the uh, on online marketplaces and shopping online as opposed to um, simply um, transacting or uh, interacting online uh, and what we're going to start with is to look in, in a bit more detail at the benefits that uh, online marketplaces have brought um, to consumers um, for example convenience and, and the breadth of products um, but also the role in, in protecting and empowering consumers that we've heard um, we've heard about in the opening session and, uh, and, and the previous the previous discussion um, the OECD has been looking at um, online, mar online marketplaces in particular uh, it, since 2017, and which we started with um, a consumer survey on trust in peer-to-peer -peer platforms, um, which um, did find that consumers experienced problems, but nevertheless continued um, to use them to purchase, rent or swap goods and services, particularly around accommodation, transportation, and, and indeed a, a broadening um, set of uh, products and services. Um, more recently, we've, um, we've been looking at, um, at the particular uh, benefits and challenges and to work out how to trade those off in particular. So I'm guessing uh, that most of you listening um, shop online regularly. I know. I know. I, I certainly spend a, a large amount of my time online. Not 
not, not just at work, but outside of work as well. Um, and that that's brought um, the possibility um, of accessing services from all over the world, um, different products. Um, and we really want to highlight those uh, and to talk about potential new services. So it'd be really interesting to hear, particularly from those uh, on the uh, from the marketplaces themselves, several of which are represented on the panel about new um, offerings that are coming up as, as we move um, we move ahead. We do want to balance that with a bit of discussion about the, the possible challenges uh, and to hear from uh, consumer authorities uh, and the marketplaces and indeed uh, wider representatives about how we resolve those issues and continue to ensure that marketplaces can offer um, a, um, a platform in which consumers can trust and invest their money. Um, but just before we, we move into the, the questions and hear um, from, uh, from, from the panel on a lot of these interesting issues, um, we'd like to canvas you on your experiences with um, online marketplaces and Kathy and I will come back to the answers to these. So um, really um, be great to hear from you. Um, please do, um, please do fill in the uh, fill in the panel uh, fill it sorry fill in the survey and um, it should be appearing in on the right hand side where you can see the um, the, the questions and the chat uh, and there should be an interactivity um, panel um, that you can uh, that you can click on and um, fill in that survey uh, while we're talking. Um, that will only be open um, for uh, a few minutes, so um, please have a look now. There's some fairly simple questions, but it's just to get a, a sense of what's um, of what's what's happening in your views. So while you're doing that, um, we'll uh, we'll move on to the the first question, um, uh, first discussion topic. So we're going to look at um, consumer benefits uh, from from online marketplaces in particular. Um, there's, there's obviously, as we've heard um, already, a, an enormous expansion in the amount of um, commerce that is happening online. That's been um, expanded even further by um, lockdown and the fact that we haven't been able to go to, to physical shops, um, but it seems to be a trend that's likely to continue. Um, there is a, a 2019 survey that found that digital marketplaces generated around 47% of online sales, um, and we would be reasonably confident that that's gone up quite dramatically in in, in the last year uh, year or two. Um, so um, I'll ask I'll ask some questions about these um, uh, about these benefits, and we'll start with um, with Christine. Um, could you um, perhaps give us um, an overview of the, the different types of um, of online marketplaces that consumers uh, engage in today? Great. Um, thank you, Andrew, and, and to the organising team at the OECD for this exciting afternoon ahead of us. Online marketplaces, as we call them in this panel, are effectively quite numerous. Um, they're quite different from each other, but I wanted to situate them before we heard from our speakers um, exactly what segment we are looking at. So we can think of online marketplaces as a subcategory, a subgroup of online platforms. Um, if you direct yourself to the OECD web pages on consumer protection and digital, you find a couple of reports that will help you um, get to grip with this market and, and how it functions, notably one on an introduction to online platforms and their role in digital transformation. And there that talks about all of the platforms available. But what we are focusing more precisely on this afternoon are marketplaces. So those are e-commerce platforms um, that are also explored in OECD um, documentation, notably a report on, on unpacking e-commerce, looking at the business models, the trend and policies. And in that report, you'll find that there's a, a distinction to be made between the business models that facilitate purchases between buyers and sellers, alongside the development of what, what we call subscription e-commerce, as well as some, as some online and offline models. So this afternoon, we pay particular attention to platforms that facilitate purchases. And we have some representative of those platforms, Catch, Finn, or Amazon. Um, but I wanted to point out um, that the panel is not perhaps complete because there is a surge in social commerce, um, more and more transactions that are taking place, shopping that is taking place on social media platforms. And we heard a little bit about um, Facebook in the, in the previous panel. So perhaps um, that situates where we are at and what we are talking about right now. Oh, thank you so much, Christine. That's a really um, that's a really helpful start um, to understand understand what we're talking about here and that that greater focus. 
So um, turning to our, um, uh, our, our marketplace representatives, um, Carletta, Christian and James, it would be really interesting to hear from each of you um, in turn, um, your perspective on what are the top reasons that um, consumers um, have for choosing to, to shop in online marketplaces? Uh, what do they buy? And do you have a sense of what expectations they have uh, when, when they do so? So perhaps um, Carletta, starting with you. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be on the panel and the opportunity to talk about our commitment uh, to customer safety. At Amazon, we often speak about what we call our flywheel for growth. The core concept is just that by offering lower prices and vast selection and fast delivery, we're going to continue to drive traffic and growth, all consumer benefits that have been outlined in the OECD report on the role of online marketplaces in enhancing protection for consumers. Um, as to why customers are choosing online marketplaces, besides selection, it's, it's also convenience. Um, and we have some data that shows that. As Jeff noted in his annual shareholder letter, customers complete about 28% of their uh, Amazon purchases in three minutes or less. And about 50% of people actually complete their purchases in less than 15 minutes. So if you compare that to a typical shopping trip to a physical store where you have to drive, you have to park, you have to search, you have to wait in the checkout line, you have to find your car and then you have to drive home, research will show us that that takes about an hour. So if you compare shopping at Amazon at 15 minutes and you compare that to the uh, physical store that you probably are gonna do twice a week, right? You're gonna save about 75 hours a year. So not insignificant. Over the years, we've also understood that customers expect not only great selection, but when they make a purchase on our store, either directly from Amazon or from our selling partners, um, they'll receive a safe product. Um, as a customer obsessed company, uh, earning and maintaining customer trust is of the utmost concern to Amazon. For these reasons, product safety and regulatory compliance more generally is a top priority. We want customers to be able to buy from our stores with confidence because that trust keeps customers coming back. Again, we're excited to participate in the panel. Uh, we believe it reaffirms our commitment to working collaboratively with brands, manufacturers, regulators, policymakers, law enforcement, and other stakeholders to protect the integrity of our store. Well, thanks very much, Carlos. A very, uh, really interesting and great, great to have you here. Um, Christian, perhaps you could um, perhaps we could hear from you on on reasons and and what and what expectations consumers have. Sure. Uh, in our experience, there are many reasons why consumers uh, choose to shop in our marketplaces, and of course, the reasons depend a little bit on what the consumer is looking for. And we have everything from general merchandise to cars to uh, properties and even jobs in our classified marketplaces. Uh, Price is a clear motivator, uh, and that's regardless of what kind of uh, item you're looking for. Uh, and in our marketplaces, you can usually find items at uh, greatly discounted prices, both for used goods and also for uh, new goods, of course. And then, apart from price, uh, broad selection, uh, and also the opportunity to find items that you wouldn't be able to find elsewhere, are also motivations that we see consumers have. And uh, of course, uh, convenience, uh, as has been mentioned here, is also a contributing reason. And I, I think we saw that really grow during the pandemic, uh, where we saw uh, such uh, extreme growth in our marketplaces. Then I would mention a, a last uh, uh, motivator that we see in the Nordics. And that is that uh, environmental concerns is, uh, is growing as a reason. Uh, and there is uh, a quite strong consumer trend gravitating towards secondhand and towards uh, reuse. Uh, and that is something we particularly see in urban areas. Uh, so even though I think price and selection will continue to be the most important uh, factors, I, I also think that uh, this uh, uh, environmental trends will grow demand for uh, secondhand items. Thanks very much, Christian. Very, very interesting. And then, um, James, perhaps we can hear from you. I, I appreciate maybe maybe difficult to find some uh, find some answers that that Carletta and Christian haven't covered already. But um, please, uh, please go ahead. 
No worries. And thanks, Andrew, and to the OACD for organising today. Um, but obviously, as touched on by my fellow, fellow panellists, it's no real secret to anyone that marketplace platforms provide consumers with greater choice, convenience and lower prices on everyday consumer purchases. In Australia, we have a unique geography. We live in a vast country about the size of the mainland USA, um, but our population is relatively small with about 25 million people. Um, so our population spread drives demand for convenient online shopping experiences and being able to buy something at any time of day on your phone, tablet or computer, wherever you are, and have it arrive in a matter of hours or days is a powerful value proposition, particularly for people that live in more remote locations mm. where shopping online might be something that they have to do as a first rather than a last choice. Um, Compared to some other markets, Australia is also a relatively small but expensive market for, for consumer goods. So choice for consumers is often limited in in-store uh, retail environments, and we generally pay higher prices than comparable nations. Um, so the vast array of products offered by platforms, both um, domestically and from overseas sellers, gives consumers that extra flexibility and access to products they might not otherwise be able to acquire um, locally. Um, we also sell goods across a really broad range of categories um, and generally speaking our, speaking, our consumers buy across that range. So you can have a person buying car parts in the same shopping cart as their skincare products and you can't really do that in an in-store environment. You would have to go to several different stores to buy um, those kind of products at specialist retailers. So yeah, I think those are the massive key benefits that online retail can offer. Thank you so much, and, um, and and great to hear about those and the, the geographic differences as well, and how those how those apply. Um, so, um, just just to, to sort of stay with our um, industry representatives, um, perhaps we could just hear in the same order, um, just a bit more about any um, new needs that you might be anticipating, or any kind of new changes that you might be making um, to uh, update your business model in terms of kind of. Um, developing consumer expectations and consumer needs um, but perhaps encourage you to be a little bit shorter just as we're, we're a little bit uh, we're a little bit behind time but yes be very interested to hear about um, business model and then anything that you're that you're planning to change coming up um, Carletta we'll start with you again thanks uh, sure thank you uh, from day one we've tried to empower other businesses that we work with especially small and medium-sized enterprises uh, back in 1999, we opened our store to selling partners so they could sell directly to customers right alongside us. Um, the model helped us keep innovating and competing on behalf of customers. It also brought millions of global businesses into our store and it let customers benefit from you know, vast selection and the lower prices. The model of connecting millions of businesses with hundreds of millions of customers is, is integral to our business plan. Today, more than half of the items customers buy on Amazon or purchase from sellers in our stores. Many of them are small and medium sized businesses. When we look to the future, we are gonna to continue to invest in technology. We're gonna to continue to further develop tools with the customer in mind. Uh, we're in the process right now of creating a unified network that extracts and correlates relevant product information from different types of documents, including product safety documents. And that's going to streamline the process for our sellers to be able to list items on Amazon. Additionally, as both image recognition technology and natural language AI improve, we're going to be able to leverage them even more to be precise and proactive with our tool set. Thank you very much. Um, Christian, over to you. Any, any further thoughts on business model and innovations? Well, one of the clear trends that we see is that uh, consumers are now digitally native and it really affects the kind of uh, experiences that they prefer and they uh, expect. And, and uh, they really chase these friction-free uh, online experiences and they, they don't have any loyalty um, if this service isn't up to par. So uh, our ambition is, of course, to create uh, completely seamless experiences for the consumer. And uh, our ambition is to make it as simple to shop used goods, consumer to consumer, as it is to buy new goods from an online uh, retailer. And we, we kind of invested heavily into that. Uh, so right now we are working in, in uh, improving some of these transaction journeys. And, 
Just to give you an example, uh, we have created a service in, um, for consumer-to-consumer -consumer card transactions in our Norwegian marketplace Finn. Uh, and it's a service that is completely seamless, digital, and enables things like uh, ownership uh, change, uh, re-registration of the car, payment and insurance in one uh, full digital uh, experience. And I actually think it's one of the more advanced consumer-to-consumer uh, -consumer car transaction experiences uh, out there. So just to give you one example. Thank you, that's fantastic. And, uh, and James, um, what, what can we um, expect, from, uh, expect from Catch in the next few years? Well, I thought I'd approach this question maybe from the seller side of the services that we offer, because mm -hmm. a big issue for us on um, the consumer level is how do we enhance consumer trust in the platform? And that means that we need to um, have sellers that have the same level of rigor and diligence that we um, bring to our own retail business, uh, to our marketplace mm -hmm. business. So what we're looking at is um, introducing and enhancing the education uh, programs that we bring to sellers. And um, what that means for us is investing more in creating enhanced education modules for our sellers. So what we're looking to launch in the near future is um, a series of online modules where sellers can go on and view video information and undertake online modules that educate them about their requirements in relation to product safety and their requirements in relation to um, our policies and procedures and how to respond to consumer complaints that will enhance the uh, consumer experience in the long run. Well, thanks to thanks to you for those aren't for, for that answer. That's all really interesting and some really um some really useful things um coming up there. Just to um before we move on to the next topic, just to um thank you um uh to the audience for um filling in the the survey. Just to just to let you know um we've had the we've had the preliminary results um in terms of what you like the most. Um Nearly forty percent of you have um, have said that that it's um, it's more product choice that um, that really draws you to the the platform. Um, just over twenty percent have said that um, ratings and reviews uh, are are also helpful. So that that's really interesting. But obviously um, some some different answers. But really interesting to um, the, the the first answer there wasn't price, which might have been what I um, I expected actually. So it's that choice angle that um, that at least the audience here are, are reacting to. Um, on the second question, problems that you that you may have personally experienced. Uh, the narrow uh, winner, as it were, is um, other, unfortunately, which is um, perhaps not quite as uh, not as helpful as we might have said. So that's late uh, non-delivery, unexpected charges, uh, or difficult to cancel. And nearly 50% of you have, um, have have picked that option. The the close runner-up, um, if that's the right terminology. Uh, so just over 40% of you have said that the product was not as described, which is, I, I think, you know, that's a that's a pretty high um, that's a pretty high response rate. Um, so the the wrong thing the wrong thing turned out or it wasn't it wasn't as you described it now obviously these these questions aren't um the, 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 those answers aren't directed specifically at the, uh, the, the the platforms that are on the panel today that's a that's a broader response rate but quite um quite a quite an interesting um quite an interesting um set of responses uh, and sorry the the first the first question on average how often do you um, purchase products uh 38% of you have said that you buy uh, a few times a month, uh, and there's a there's a range of other answers as perhaps um, perhaps you'd expect it. Um, but nearly seven percent have said um, have said that you buy um, buy online daily, um, which is you know obviously up from uh, up from previous um, previous numbers that I've seen. Um, so um, just to remind you, um, please do put um, put your questions into the chat, and we'll we'll come back to those at the end. But we'll now move on to um, our second theme, um, which is looking more at the the sort of risks and, and and joint challenges that we all share as users and and, and uh, creators and, and and shoppers and sellers online. Um, and um, we'll start with um, Monique. Um, can I ask um, you know, what kind of risks do you think that consumers are encountering uh, encountering in online marketplaces, and are there any um, differences that um, Bayek have observed um, across um, European countries, for example? Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm delighted to, to have been asked to uh, represent the EU consumer perspective uh, on this very, very interesting panel. Uh, well, first of all, I would already like to react to what I heard from the marketplaces because it's about choice and it's about convenience. But one of the risks related to consumer choice 
is that your choice as a consumer is being manipulated because it's the platform that decides what you're watching. So the free consumer choice, when I decide to go in different shops, I, I decide what shops I'm visiting. If I'm on a platform and I'm in the platforms under the platform's control. So there is a risk of manipulated consumer choice. That was not in my initial briefing, but as I listened carefully, I need to say that. But then uh, what I certainly wanted to, to say as from the start, there is much too much illegal activities that are um, present and that are in fact, to answer already one of your questions, Andrew, uh, common to all European countries. So there is not really a geographical um, um, difference there because also it's a global economy now. Right? So we're speaking about global marketplaces. And we uh, consumer organizations and especially Berg members have uh, demonstrated and are still demonstrated, uh, demonstrating that there is a much too high level of unsafe products uh, on on the on those platforms that can be that can be uh, bought on those uh, platforms. There has been a study where we um, uh, purchased 250 products from 18 product categories, and 66 percent of those products, so two out of three, uh, failed the safety test. And it was about fire alarms that didn't sound the alarm. It is about cl uh, kids clothes that still has strangulation uh, risk. It's about uh, Christmas trees, uh, lights that uh, can uh, you know, get you electrocution. So there is a lot still going on, but unsafe products, and I can go on, but I only have two minutes. So I respect my time. Unsafe products are not the only problem. It's also about other violations of consumer rights. For example, uh, our member in Austria, Arbeiterkammer, it took them less than an hour to find on, uh, on Facebook, on TikTok, on Instagram, on Google, misleading offers. Uh, uh, and so this is something that is quite easy to find. Um, also scams, and certainly under COVID, and maybe Niels will refer to that later, but under the COVID pandemic, there have been huge amount, an increase of scams, fake reviews, uh, people who trick you out of your money, uh, aggressive behavior towards younger people. So uh, as a, uh, just to keep it very short, what we can say is that platforms fail to take sufficient measures to prevent consumer harm, be it in terms of physical safety, be it in terms of protection of their rights. And we really believe that current legislation and especially the enforcement of that legislation need to be stepped up, need to be upgraded in order to be fit for the 21st century. Thanks very much, me. Um, you've covered a, a lot of ground, uh, a lot of ground there, and I'm sure there's and there's some things that people would like to react to there. But perhaps we can weave uh, weave that into the discussion as we as we go ahead. Um, so, um, j just picking up your point about enforcement in particular. Um, I'll, I'll restrain my myself from, from commenting as a representative of, as a, of an enforcement agency and ask um, Christine to perhaps um, talk about some of the enforcement actions being taken around um, by authorities around the world in relation to some of these issues. And are there any, um, particularly, are there any common challenges coming out um, in different jurisdictions in enforcing the existing law? Yes, I can uh, confirm that currently enforcers all around the world are remarkably busy. Um, their efforts focus on product safety, as Monique highlighted, which is a key issue, but also more generally on scams. And um, <clears throat> the surge of the pandemic has also uh, created a lot of work <laughs> for enforcers. Um, we saw a lot of price gouging um, in particular and a lot of items that were advertised that didn't obviously have the properties they were claiming to have notably cures and so on and so forth um, the um, challenges I think uh, will echo what Monique said they are quite international uh, if you look around the world the problems there are there are national differences and 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 cultural differences, but by and large, I think all enforcers are struggling with the same issues. Uh, perhaps the, the main one is um, the international reach of practices and the speed at which those practices that are stopped can then re-emerge somewhere else mm -hmm. in the world. So it seems that enforcers are a little bit engaged in a game of whack-a-mole as soon as one is whacked, it just pops somewhere else and um, the problem might be moved on but never really completely completely eradicated. Um, so that's, I think, a, a big challenge for enforcers. I think the other big challenge, and, and the OECD is working on that, and the UNCTAD working group is also working on this, is really the lack of harmonized um, enforcement rules across the world. Mm -hmm. We have more harmonization in regions, which is great, and more coordination now in regions, but there's still 
big bridges to be built. I want to um, attract the attention to two um, initiatives and, and, and work that is currently underway, because I don't want to leave uh, our audience thinking that you are, the enforcers are just not able to cope and nothing is happening. Um, there is actually notably a great work being carried out at the OECD on product safety. Notably, there's been a 2020 recommendations on consumer product safety. And there is um, also a global recourse portal that was introduced in the video right at the start of the conference. Those are tools that are being developed. And at UNCTAD, there's also a lot of work, notably headed by the FTC and the CMA, on cross-border consumer enforcement. Um, that includes OECD and ESPEN input as well. So a lot of coordination and a lot of work going on. But unfortunately, all this work is still work in progress and has not yet resulted in uniform international rules or enforcement regimes. What that means is that for consumers, it's still a little bit confusing um, because you could be using an online marketplace uh, and not necessarily understand that your rights can differ depending on where your seller is located or depending on where the marketplace might also be operating mm -hmm. from. So I think still a lot of work um, to be had, but I can reassure everyone that the enforcers are very busy. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for the, the vote of confidence, um, Christine, and also for, for that very helpful overview. It was a, a tough question to ask you to sum up global enforcement in uh, in one session. So thank you very much. Um, just just to highlight to those that are interested in those um, points that you made rightly on product safety and cooperation, that there are separate sessions, um, you know, coming up tomorrow and, and Thursday, looking specifically at those where you can you can hear more about both of those. But thank you for highlighting both of those points. Um, so turning now to to Niels, it would be it would be really interesting to hear about um, some of the, the the challenges that the European authorities have been grappling with, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, consumer protection in online marketplaces, and, and in particular how, how perhaps connecting some of these back to the the challenges um, raised by, by by Monique in her answer. Well, thanks a lot, Andrew, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, indeed, I think that the, the the challenges that uh, we in the European Union are facing they come from two angles. From one side, from, from the business uh, side, from the platforms uh, themselves, but from the other side, also, let's say, from the government response. Looking at the business side, uh, apart from the sheer volume uh, of the, the transactions uh, that is happening, it's indeed also um, uh, the, the complexity, the diversity, and the fast-changing structure of the, the online trade and the, the, of the business models. Just three, three points first. Mm. Um, uh, and that's the point that um, uh, I think Christina already made. Uh, we have marketplaces inside and outside the EU, but having them outside the EU is already a total different ball game. You don't have a person to talk to. If there's a problem, you sometimes uh, even consumers, market surveillance authorities don't find the person to reach out. Uh, it, it, it's much more complicated. Plus, you have a direct delivery into your territory, but that means also that the customs can't uh, often control at the borders properly uh, whether the products that come in comply with the requirements, product safety, etc. Meaning that you shift responsibility on control from the borders to the, uh, let's say, inside the, the market controls. And for this, the, the authorities are not yet fully equipped. The second point is that the marketplaces themselves have different roles, and uh, Carlotta uh, referred to that. Uh, sometimes they're intermediaries, but sometimes they're partners, traders themselves. Mm. Again, yes, that's fine sometimes, but it also raises tensions, uh, uh, possible competition issues, and sometimes for the consumers, unclarity who is really their partner. Third point, the changes in this online trade. You have a trader that appears. You enforce against the trader. The, the, the next day, the trader has disappeared, uh, in particular if uh, this trader is outside your territory. The day after, another trader comes up, similar name, but of course, you can't immediately prove that it's the same trader, but still you find the same product. So th there are quite some changes coming from the business side, but also from the governmental response side, a couple of challenges. Um, first is that sometimes we have conflicting policy objectives. Of course, we want to make sure that consumer rights fully are enforced online like offline in terms of pre-contractual information, withdrawal, complaints handling, product safety, whatever. But at the same time, you all the platforms have a role in terms of fundamental rights. So once they start banning, for example, products, 
that contain LGBTI stories because they don't like this kind of sexual orientation. Let's say it's not just anymore a question of, let's say, a defensive role, but also you, you, you let's say, want to be prudent that they don't uh, make policy themselves. And mm -hmm. the second point is simply that the regulatory framework, in my view, uh, has not caught up with the speed of development of, uh, of the market. And that's something that we are working on in Europe. But of course, it's a challenge that we face uh, worldwide. No, thanks very much, Niels. I, I, I certainly a number of those, or well, all of those points are things that I'm, I'm, um, I've come across in my my time. So thank you, uh, thank you for highlighting those. And I think it's really interesting to to point out the the, the sort of tension with government's um, policy objectives as well, and that there's lots of different things we need to to trade off here, as well as just consumer rights. Although that's obviously what we're sort of focused on in this in this discussion here. But uh, thank you again. So um, having heard about some of the risks and challenges from from the the, the sort of the, the consumer and the um, authority perspective uh, we can perhaps go back to our industry reps to hear about um what kind of challenges uh that they're facing and how how those are being uh, how those are being dealt with um and i mean i guess you know is it is it just as simple as being tougher uh, and you know removing removing traders who break the law from uh, from your marketplace and perhaps we'll start with uh, with with uh, christian this time well, I wish it was that uh, simple, but it, it isn't. Uh, so, first of all, let me just separate between uh, professional traders, so B2C, and uh, individuals, so consumer to consumer trade. Uh, and when we talk about consumer to consumer, uh, some of our uh, online marketplaces, uh, like uh, Finn in Norway, as an example, is just so expansive and so integrated into the Norwegian society that being banned from it has uh, quite severe uh, repercussions for the individual. So if you are banned from Finn, as an example, you are effectively hindered from buying a car, uh, renting a house, even applying for a job uh, in Norway. So as you can understand, uh, being banned is such a heavy penalty that we have to make sure that we have uh, solid legal grounds for it. Then another point is that uh, the option to ban someone uh, it can't be uh, contingent on having a fully committed crime, so to speak. So in the instance of uh, ongoing fraud, we have to be able to ban um, uh, a user quickly and uh, effectively to protect uh, the other person from harm. So uh, some of the, these cases, they have to rely on uh, past behavior. Uh, and really to investigate this, we have uh, several uh, monitoring practices in place. But of course, it isn't clear cut and it is a really complex issue. And uh, I, I just want to say that we have to be very conscious of the consequences of, of our actions for all, all the parties. And finally then, when we, when we talk about professional traders, uh, it's uh, equally important that we have uh, sound legal grounds to act because if a trader here is, uh, is um, banned, uh, they risk their whole uh, business, their whole income, and it can even lead to bankruptcy. Uh, so again, we have to be very certain that uh, banning them is uh, the right thing to do. Uh, and we also have to give them some option to appeal uh, or argue their case before the suspension goes uh, into effect. So it's, it's a quite time consuming and a rather frustrating process both for the marketplaces and, uh, and uh, for uh, the traders and uh, certainly the consumers uh, as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting. And, and I think we'll return to that um, B2C, B2B um, question, I suspect, um, later on. Um, perhaps um, I can um, turn to Carletta next. So for us, you know, a violation of our policies uh, can and often does result in the removal of offers up to and including the removal of selling privileges. We do this in order to protect the customers that visit the Amazon stores. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, customer safety is a top priority and we want to make sure that customers are confident. I, I, you know, aside from kind of what we do and how we do it, I did want to um, just spend a, a quick minute on something Christine mentioned, and I think it's super important and it relates to the challenges, right? Um, I think this is something, again, there's a lot of opportunity. One of the challenges is the lack of harmonization. And, and I do think OECD is, is 
perfectly placed to help tackle that. Um, for a global company that you know does businesses in many jurisdictions, Amazon has a ton of rules to comply with. And we want to comply with the rules, right? We invest heavily in our safety and our compliance programs. Um, what I would say is that the fragmentation and some of the difficulty when you look across jurisdictions and across authorities and the highly matrixed compliance ecosystem is that a lot of that complexity, um, a lot of those challenges really don't help consumers, right? Um, it doesn't create a level playing field and, and actually rather it adds complexity and administrative burden. Um, I also think the challenge of recall notifications is important to, to highlight. Um, it's something that we're working uh, with various regulators on. Um, you know, the uh, European Commission's uh, DG Just and Australia with ACCC, because when the notices aren't clear, when we don't have the right product identifying information, um, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to find the stuff. It's difficult to get the stuff down. Um, I think I would point folks to a recent uh, eSight um, study that helps provide more insights on the topic. Uh, but we, we certainly look for um, help, guidance, uh, and partnership uh, for a minimum standard for recall notifications. Thank you very much. Um, and um, James, any, any thoughts about challenges and mitigations and uh, uh, what, what, your, what your business is doing in that space? Yeah, so as has been said, um, banning sellers is a blunt instrument in most cases, I think, not the best way to achieve the most desirous outcomes for consumers, sellers and platform. In our experience, the vast majority of our sellers are trying to do the right thing, but a key challenge we've noticed um, and touching on a bit of what Carletta said is particularly for smaller and medium sized sellers, navigating the myriad of legal and regulatory obligations can be complex, resource intensive and levels of understanding across a variety of regulatory areas between these sellers mix. Another challenge is offered by international sellers who despite our platform uh, policies are used to laws and policy regimes in other jurisdictions. So when we try to enforce Australian laws and ways of operating on those sellers, they have a hard time understanding that. Platforms are in many ways uniquely position to assist these sellers understand their requirements through our experience in serving millions of customers and the support networks that we have to achieve this. Um, so we can provide sellers assistance in a variety of ways, including clear and easy to follow platform policies. But as I've touched on earlier, we really try to adopt um, an education first approach and investing in tools to educate sellers on how they can meet their compliance obligations. So we provide education through the form of published guides, for example, product safety guides. We provide education through the form of bulletins that we sell sellers and we provide regular updates and newsletters on regulatory um, changes and uh, emerging product safety, safety standards. And as part of our engagement with regulators, we also make available through our platform materials published by those regulators and notify sellers when these become available. And thirdly, when it comes to incidences of non-compliance, depending upon the circumstances, we'll also provide direct one-to-one -one coaching with sellers on how to meet our expectations and what our policy requirements are before we go through the process of um, putting in place more stringent steps against sellers to enforce platform policies and discourage illegal conduct. Thanks very much, James. Great. Um, and then finally, in this topic, before we move on to uh, initiatives, our final, our final topic. Um, I would like to come back to um, Monique and, and just ask um, what kind of actions um, Bayek sees as, as really making a, a difference in uh, making improvements on the, the challenges that you, that you mentioned earlier uh, in relation to online marketplaces. And that could be either, um, you know, activities that the marketplaces are taking themselves. So we've heard, we've heard some, some really interesting points from our, from our, our trade representatives, but, but also by enforcement authorities. Well, yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, let me be very straightforward. If uh, self-regulation would work, we would know it by now. Uh, so what we see, I mean, there are, of course, interesting initiatives, but there are elements that people, marketplaces, platforms, traders need to be obliged by regulation to do, otherwise they wouldn't do it. And we really need a regulatory intervention to increase online consumer protection. And what would be needed from our perspective, just a few uh, ideas, I could speak for a long time. Uh, first of all, we need a stricter liability regime for, for marketplaces, so for online marketplaces, this is really very important. We need also clear obligations 
positive obligations for all platforms, not only the big ones, uh, small, large. I mean, from the consumer perspective, it doesn't make a difference. The risk is the same. And uh, for uh, those obligations, for example, should um, relate to verification of traders and also to random uh, checks controls of what's being sold on the marketplace. And then I would like to respond to what Christian has been saying. It's costing a lot of uh, time. It's costing a lot of money. Yes, but you are creating a new risk on the market. So, uh, And that risk needs to be catered for. I mean, if you put a new risk on the market, you are responsible for that. I think there is a lot of revenue that is being uh, um, generated thanks to this new business model. Well, that needs then also to come with some cost in order to make it uh, consumer proof and, and, and certainly to make, it, uh, to make it safe. And there I would like to say, because we hear a lot of good things uh, that are being um, being done by the marketplaces that are present and uh, on this on this panel. But uh, uh, let's also make a reality check. For example, um, we have uh, our member in the UK, which have flagged at different moments to a marketplace like Amazon that there are unsafe children car seats on the marketplace in 2014 in 2017, in 2019, and those car seats were still on the market. So uh, there is a problem there of follow up when uh, even other, we, would it be enforcement authorities or e even consumer watchdogs, uh, if they flag something that is not safe, well, that product should not reappear on the marketplace. Uh, there should be a, a system that prevents those uh, products to be uh, reappearing. And of course, uh, there should also be stricter rules and again, more enforcement on how content is promoted via advertising and recommender systems uh, that, that, that are being promoted there. Uh, and again, uh, speaking like Christine already mentioned, we need uh, uh, swifter and more efficient uh, redress and enforcement. And I would like to say this is not only about money, this is also about skilling up the enforcers. We need, uh, I mean, because it is uh, modern enforcement needs also a very good understanding uh, of how the internet works. Uh, and that might need maybe more than uh, the, the traditional enforcement uh, skills mm -hmm. and capacities. Thank you. No, thanks very much, Monique. I mean, that 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 there's a lot uh, there's a lot to react to there. I mean, that that last point, I think, um, uh, in the UK, we've um, we've we're in the process of setting up a digital markets unit, and it was very interesting um, to hear from our Japanese colleague that there was a plan to create a new digital regulator in Japan. If if I understood uh, from that presentation, so maybe there is a a, a greater. Uh, kind of acceptance of that last point that you made. Um, although there's a lot, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of uh, interesting developments and challenges there. Um, just um, conscious of time, and I'd like to react to more of that, but we, we need to we need to keep moving with the agenda. So moving on to our, our final topic, which is really around um, initiatives to enhance um, consumer protection. Uh, and and as as, um, as several um, several of the speakers of, of, of the panelists have mentioned, you know that's something that um, you know government and businesses. So that's you know policymakers, enforcers, but also the, the, the platforms themselves or the marketplaces themselves are, are, are doing. Um, and that um, obviously historic sort of interventions in this space and certainly the sort of older school um, uh, way of looking at enforcement was that it was all about transparency and it was an enabling giving people uh, the information they needed to, to, to make. Um, uh, to make those kind of decisions, but obviously the more there's, there's there's perhaps a risk that the more we kind of mandate particular disclosures or requirements, the the more we might um, the more we might limit the ability of those firms to sort of innovate and to come up with the um, you know the the, the great um, the, the great changes that we've seen in the last in, in the last ten years in particular and uh, some really positive innovations. So um, we'd we'd like to um, sort of react to and hear, hear from the panelists about uh, about those thoughts, and perhaps we could start with with Niels and. Um, uh, an overview and appreciate this is a difficult topic to cover in a couple of minutes but perhaps you could tell us um, a, a bit about the um, the unions um, the European Union's Digital Service Act and how the European Union is sort of navigating these issues and those kind of trade-offs between transparency innovation mandated requirements um, please so sure, with pleasure um, indeed uh, we are pursuing a couple of, of uh, legislative initiatives at the moment in the European Union precisely uh, to, to update the, the legal framework, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, the purpose is not to, to restrict this very important economic area, but to make sure that, um, let's say, it's, it's um, an economic growth which uh, complies with the overall uh, values behind this uh, economic area, and of course also that consumer laws are properly uh, enforced. The Digital Services Act 
uh, would be um, it, it's a proposal currently discussed in our uh, let's say legal institutions. Uh, it's a proposal which amends the current rules on on uh, online marketplaces. Um, would apply across the board, so not just for consumer uh, policy issues, but really for, for all uh, underlying issues. Um, but from a consumer perspective, uh, there are a couple of very important improvements that the DSA would bring. One example, um, platforms would be obliged to, to um, uh, foresee compliance by design, as we call it. So they would have to be designed in a way that um, traders can comply with their pre-contractual information in, uh, obligations as well as information on product safety. Very important because the platforms determine whether um, those um, uh, traders can comply with their obligations. Second, um, platforms also will have to um, uh, know their business customers. They, um, they have to have, uh, let's say, a verification uh, of whom they are dealing with. Not that they have to control on the ground, but they have to have some understanding. Again, because in terms of enforcement, the, the marketplaces become an important partner and they need to have uh, at least key information. Also very important, bear in mind this international dimension of the trade. Um, platforms will need to have a legal representative in the European Union if they are located outside, precisely for the problems I, I mentioned before. It is the, if there is a problem, you have a person uh, to whom you can talk. And if there's an enforcement procedure, again, you have someone who is uh, legally responsible. Mm. So that's the overall framework. But then we're also updating the consumer laws simply because on product safety, for example, we need to be even more specific than the DSA. Just to give you one example, if we have an order to remove an unsafe product, and Monique mentioned a couple of the, those incidents which we find day by day, we want to have a precise deadline of two days where the platform then has to react uh, and take down the product at the latest. Product traceability. Um, we need to make sure that also products appearing on platforms have the minimum information that if there's an issue, the market surveillance authorities can trace back where the product is coming from. Last point, uh, identify the products concerned, the problem that Carletta mentioned. Yes, we need to, to be sure that we have the precise information, but there are a couple of possibilities uh, in terms of uh, even uh, IT tools, which will allow us, uh, as we believe, to identify the product so that then the obligations of the platforms are proportionate, but can also mm. be properly enforced. Hmm. Well, thanks very much, Nils. That's that's a, a lot to cover in a very short time, but uh, really interesting to hear those proposals. Um, so um, we'll go back to Monique now to react to the, the Digital Services Act and the other uh, EU um, recommendations. Do you think that do you think that those are heading in the right direction? Uh, yes, yes. For once, I can be positive. Uh, DSA is certainly a, a good starting point. And as Niels already mentioned, to know your business customer obligation is something that we welcome uh, very much. Of course, it's uh, it's about, uh, let's say, uh, the, a little bit to verify your trader obligation that I've, I have been uh, referring to. Uh, we would like we would like to see the Parliament and the Council still improving the, the DSA on a few points. Uh, for example, a positive liability uh, for marketplaces. For the moment, it's all uh, worded like it was in the e-commerce directive in a negative way. They are not liable if, while we would really like to see more uh, positive, uh, strong liability uh, and, and the, uh, when online marketplaces need to deliver to their, to their, to their customers, meaning the consumers. Um, and uh, there, uh, because paying fines is not enough. Uh, paying fines is just part of the balance sheet of those uh, of the of the marketplaces, and we also uh, want uh, uh, more, as I, we said, stronger responsibilities also for smaller uh, platforms, and not not an over reliance uh, um, to on transparency and on co or self regulation. One point I would like to mention, and a little bit in response and in complementary to what Neil said, it, it, indeed DSA is just a piece of the of the puzzle. We have the General Product Safety Directive, we have the Product Liability Directive, we have maybe the unfair commercial practices directive and for the moment we hear the policymakers on the dsa say it's not here it will be there and there is this mm -hmm. ping pong game uh, maybe the policymakers know what they're doing i mean because they have a more uh, overall uh, the global picture but we are very much afraid and experience has shows, shown over the past that if something is being pushed into the court of somebody else at the end of the day there is a risk of regulatory gap so my call on the on the on the commission and on the policymakers at european level is just make sure of that the con that there is a full consistency between the different proposals and that there is no uh, regulatory gap um, which would then be harmful for consumers 
thanks very much, Monique. Um, and uh, that's a, I think that's that that risk of underlapping regimes is a is a really interesting one. We might come back to that if there's more time. So um, I, I guess turning a bit more to um, technology and its um, ability to solve or improve, mitigate, change uh, these problems. Uh, but perhaps I'd like to hear a bit more about that. And I mean, for example, um, we, we've heard a bit about the automatic detection of unsafe products and, and the, you know, the, the ability of or the, the role that AI or, or other, um, other tech can play in identifying complaints and problems. So um, perhaps uh, we can turn to, to Christine to elaborate on this again, another, another big question. And, and how, how do you think um, authorities and um, marketplaces should deploy these, these kind of tools? Um, so yes, recent, recently and not so recently, but um, it's now quite a public parlance to start looking at the use of algorithm in market surveillance or in consumer enforcement. Um, so the CMA you've mentioned, we heard about other experience. I, I welcome technology. I think technology can be great. And we've heard that uh, all throughout the, the, the start of this conference. But I'm slightly concerned, um, and that's on a personal note, um, with all this reliance on technology, um, it's welcome, but it's also very complex. It has limitation. And so far, what um, um, my little and limited experience in that field um, has shown is that we seem to look at AI and algorithm to detect wrongdoing rather than reparation or even prevention. So I think perhaps if we're going to use technology, we should use it to um, the full advantage of what it can deliver. But I agree with the, uh, the comments that was made earlier that there's perhaps um, a slight concern also that enforcers who are, um, we all know, underfunded by government <laughs> all around the world might actually find that they're not fighting um, with equal strength when it comes to using technology to retaliate effectively. I don't want to use sort of warfare um, kind of language but it seems a little bit like this. Um, so I much prefer the idea, and that's the work that I've been conducted as an academic, of looking at um, how harm happens for consumers and how we can actually try and look at different solutions. And, and the work that I've carried out um, in Consumer Theories of Harm, which is a book that I've co-written with Paolo Siciliani and Ahed Gamper, we've been looking at expecting fairness by design, design, which I was very pleased to hear Professor Kastrop in our previous session use and, and overuse, and I'm very happy for everyone to push the idea. We hear a lot about those by design obligations, um, but in terms of protecting consumers, it can actually deliver a lot to actually look at and realizing that harm is the result of um, a poor standard of professional diligence and therefore we can look at how consumer market operates and very often um, they are actually pushing traders even good traders to behave quite badly because um, to keep um, getting customers you need to use the dark patterns you need to harvest the data so I think if we could change the expectations and if we could now expect businesses to behave rather than consumers to be where we could actually perhaps start thinking about the problem slightly differently so we wouldn't be constantly be running after the wrongdoing but preventing it so from that flows the idea that perhaps businesses ought to be required to show that they have acted fairly rather than expect consumers or enforcers to demonstrate the violations which is often the case today no, thanks, Christine. Really, really interesting. And that um, sort of positive, proactive GT1 is maybe something we'll, we'll come back to in, in questions. I'm conscious I'm, I'm maybe parking quite a lot of uh, interesting issues there. Um, uh, perhaps we could now um, hear, um, hear from the marketplaces a bit more about um, how, how they've been using technology to, to enhance um, consumer protection and just, um, just to sort of slightly change the the order here. I might um, first ask James um, to talk about the uh, deployment of uh, of new technology in, in his marketplace, if that's okay. Sure. So um, at Catch, we do use a number of technological tools to enhance our consumer protection measures, but I think it's important for us that we maintain 
human teams um, to help achieve these goals. Because um, in our view, the technology is a tool that helps us. And as Christine has mentioned, can detect um, issues, but it's not the overall solution. So if we go back to our history, Catch launched as a dedicated retailer in 2007, and we spent a good deal of time and resources in the early years developing strong product compliance and safety frameworks that relied on experts and consumer friendly return and refund policies to enhance trust and build loyalty. And when we launched our marketplace in 2017, we decided early on we wanted to keep that experience consistent across both business um, models. So while also recognizing that we were relinquishing a lot of the controls that came through those um, human processes to trying to scale our platform. So to attempt to maintain this, con this consistency, um, in consumer experience and consumer protection standards. In addition to the education programs I've touched on, we introduced a few key measures that we used to, be, to bring that consistency. So first of all, we're not a self-service marketplace. Self-service marketplace. Sellers must go through a vetting process that includes checking their product catalogs for compliance with relevant product safety standards. So we adopted a risk tier based approach that uses software based me mechanisms supplemented by the product safety team that filter product catalogs, identify regulated products, and we then audit these sellers um, using those human teams who then ask for things like test reports to demonstrate compliance um, with their obligations. And after a seller has been listed on the platform, we then conduct uh, targeted product safety audits based on particular risks that we identify or emerging hazards in the market and potential trends. So these audits include mystery shopping, physically checking products, uh, or placing requirements on sellers to provide us certain information about the products that they sell. Um, and then we also there implement system level filters where we can block out, for example, banned products based on keywords or images, for example. Um, but we look and we look to expand the use of AI and algorithmic tools to enhance capturing unsafe products. Um, but we think it's always important to maintain a human touch to exercise complex judgment calls that require expert opinion. There's an attractiveness of platforms to rely on technology to do the work of people. And I think that's a scalable solution. But in our experience, particularly um, as a smaller platform among some of the global players, the best outcome still from engaging that personal touch, engaging those experts um, and engaging that experience that we've lived through the last 10 years of operating a platform. Thanks very much, James. Um, so, um, Christian, um, thoughts on new technology and initiatives supported by technology? Sure. Well, uh, let's start off by saying that uh, we do have uh, quite a few security measures in place uh, to protect consumers in our marketplaces. So, uh, the human touch has been mentioned, and we also have dedicated consumer protection teams to, uh, to protect consumers from fraud. Uh, I also thought the discussion on uh, identification was interesting because I believe that uh, an, improve, uh, an, an uh, important way to improve safety is to continuously develop our systems for validating and verifying uh, identities. Mm. Uh, so if you are registering as a consumer-to-consumer -consumer, uh, user on our marketplaces, the only mandatory information you have to fill in is actually an email address. However, uh, when you are doing something more risk-filled, like doing a transaction, we uh, usually uh, enforce you to verify yourself either by text message or by bank ID. Uh, and bank ID is a digital ID uh, issued by uh, banks, uh, which uh, verifies your true identity and which is widely used uh, in the Nordic. So I, I do think this is uh, a way to pro provide some protection, but uh, a lot of work uh, is also uh, in just improving the transaction journeys. And uh, keep in mind here that a lot of our focus is on consumer to consumer trade. And uh, we do have rules and processes related to uh, safe products and what's illegal to sell and so on. But most of our work is geared towards making sure that uh, consumers can trade safely with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, so I mentioned the car, to, uh, the car transaction uh, solution for C2C trade. We also have uh, similar uh, uh, solutions for distance sales to make sure that both the, uh, the buyer receives the product and the seller receives the payment. Uh, so that's usually where our uh, efforts lie. Well, thanks very much, Christian. Um, and um, 
Colette, perhaps we could hear uh, um, a bit about um, Amazon's um, use of use of tech and any initiatives that might be supporting or supported by that. Absolutely. Uh, so to James' point, though, I want to start out that we have at the core of what we do more than 10,000 subject matter experts, um, engineers and scientists who are our, our program, right? But as I also mentioned earlier, we lean heavily into technology to enhance customer protection. So we already have programs in place to identify and remove products that are recalled. Um, we know that. But we also not only remove specific recalled products, but we take action on what we are uh, looking at as adjacent products. So while we continue to improve our reactive processes, I wanted to spend just a few minutes focusing on how we detect risk and take proactive actions to identify and limit risks, much to the point Christine said was an opportunity area. Uh, our predictive technology uses both historical and present day reactive data. And it, and it actually helps us build the basis for this proactive tool. Um, so for example, a little bit about how it works. Last year we consumed uh, approximately uh, 67 million pieces of customer interactions every single week. Things like reviews or chats or phone transcriptions of calls. We take that data and we continually identify groups of related items based on common characteristics. If we see a flag on a red item, we know immediately it's going to link to a group of related items, which then allows us to proactively suppress the related items until we can investigate them further too. Uh, it's especially useful when we have newly added items to our catalog where we have few points or few pieces of information uh, to guide our risk analysis. We have developed tools uh, that are statistical, which help us kind of get to um, a risk estimation um, for new products that have no customer data or no seller data as well. When we use this predictive modeling, we're able to calculate um, risk predictions for most units and take the corrective actions before the units have ever been shipped, uh, removing potentially unsafe items from customers uh, before they can even see them listed in our store. So that allows us to both scale, which I heard mentioned, I think Christian might have mentioned it, and focus. Um, instead of working on billions of active products, we instead narrow it down to this, this small fraction of active selection in our catalog. In a, um, maybe put another way, we're confident that the vast majority of items in our catalog aren't going to raise potential issues, which frees us, uh, frees us up to use our significant resources, if you will, on the relatively small portion of items we've determined uh, are more likely to be problematic. That's really interesting. Thanks very much to, to all three of you for, for sharing that. Um, I hope you haven't given away too many um, too many commercial uh, secrets there, but um, really, really interesting. Um, just a, 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 a second question for, for the marketplaces and just to encourage you to perhaps um, be a little bit shorter, we're perhaps a little bit behind time, um, just on the cooperation between government authorities and marketplaces, which I know uh, certainly uh, my own organisation has been engaged with a lot more and more direct conversations and that um, Neil's mentioned in his, um, you know, the, 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 the DSA proposes establishing this um, point of establishment to ensure that those conversations can take place, but perhaps just a minute each on, on how cooperation between um, government authorities and marketplaces could be improved uh, in practice uh, perhaps um, starting with Niels. Sure, happy to do. Um, yes, we believe that there is definitely space for voluntary cooperation between uh, governments and, and platforms. We need, uh, let's say, clear uh, regulatory framework, but beyond there is space for voluntary cooperation. One example was a voluntary safety pledge that we entered in the past where Amazon, for example, takes uh, part and uh, lots of other platforms, big and small, where um, the platforms committed voluntarily, for example, to respect this two-day deadline, which now we want to make law. So let's say you can go further than the law foresees because the law sometimes is a bit behind. You, of course, mm. need to catch up, but the, the uh, voluntary pledge can go beyond. Mm. We should reflect together whether we should go even further because the online business is not just a question of product safety. That's one particularly visible area. But uh, at the end, consumers should be protected uh, overall as correctly online as offline. So could we go even further and see on consumer rights more horizontally? 
And even in the context of Corona, of course, suddenly uh, the, the products pop up left and right with all kind of bogus claims. We didn't have regulated tools, but platforms helped us to take down uh, millions of, of uh, bogus claims and products. This kind of cooperation is critical in a fast response. And even uh, James and Christian mentioned the areas, uh, James on education on uh, product safety, Christian on sustainability. There are roles where let's say you can go one step further, you need binding rules, but beyond the rules, there is clearly space in our view. Thanks very much, Nils. Really, uh, really interesting. Um, Self-regulation, but uh, beyond the law. Um, uh, Coletta, any, any quick thoughts from you on improving cooperation? Uh, we absolutely believe that partnerships between government authorities and marketplaces are key to, to protection of consumers. We already work closely in North America with regulators um, at, you know, at the state, at the local and at the national levels. Um, in Europe, we meet regularly with DG Just and DG Grow, and we also engage with numerous marketplace authorities, right? Um, we have a, a primary authority partnership in the UK, which helps us coordinate. And we'd like to see such partnerships be extended um, to other geographies. Uh, moreover, as Niels mentioned, we have agreed to memorandums of understanding with regulators in Turkey, the EU, and Australia. And we believe these help create protocols for those open communications so that we can quickly share information with customers and regulators uh, about the unsafe items we find in the store. And what we really feel strongly about or, or really support is the efforts to introduce similar MOUs in other geographies. Great, thank you. Um... I perhaps ought to have a look at those. Um, they sound, they sound like very interesting uh, documents. Uh, so, any any thoughts on improving cooperation? Yeah, we also operate cooperate well with uh, local government authorities, and I would add uh, also uh, with the industry organisations. Uh, those are also uh, helpful. Uh, Unfortunately, what we often see is that uh, local police enforcement, uh, for many reasons, are not able to prioritize the kind of crimes that we see in our marketplaces. And if a criminal case is shelled without any investigation, it makes it really hard for us to maintain suspensions or bans on uh, potential uh, perpetrators. Uh, I would also like to mention here privacy regulations such as GDPR, because that uh, may complicate some of the consumer protection work uh, as there are areas where we would like to collaborate with uh, other parties to uh, improve consumer uh, protection. And while GDPR doesn't kind of fully prohibit us from sharing data, uh, let's say, on notorious users, uh, we end up bearing the risk of breaking the regulation here. So I, I really think that it would be of great benefit to everyone and particularly the consumer if data sharing for fraud prevention purposes were more clearly uh, regulated. Thanks very much, um, Christian. And then um, finally on this on this question, James, do you have any anything to add on uh, cooperation? Yeah, so like the other platforms, uh, we have a good cooperative relationship with our regulatory agencies. For example, with the ACCC, we have an open regular dialogue and that led us to become one of the founding signatories to the Australian Product Safety Pledge, which is very, very similar to the EU pledge, which Amazon also um, signed last year. Um, so we see a obvious benefit to engagement with regulators, but what we'd like to see is more information sharing from regulators with platforms and similar engagements across the regulatory sphere. So as we know, consumer protection is not just limited to product safety, it touches on a broad range of areas across multiple laws and regulatory frameworks, and some agencies have better cooperative, better cooperative and communication mechanisms than others. Um, what we'd really like to see is the type of engagement we have with regulators like the ACCC, for example, expand to regulators across other agencies and have the same level of information sharing um, that goes on with those agencies. That's brilliant. Thanks very much, James. Um, and I, uh, I've seen that we've had um, a large number of very interesting um, questions uh, uh, arriving. Um, so. Um, I, I'd just very briefly give um, Monique a quick chance to react on any additional measures, but I'm grateful if you could be quick so we can move on to the Q&A. 
Thank you, Andrew. Much appreciated. I just wanted to say that, uh, of course, we welcome all the activities that have are being undertaken by the marketplaces to to get uh, to keep people safe, the MOUs, the takedowns. But on the other hand, we I mean, let me spoil the party just one second. There is a lot of lobbying going on in Europe and at WTO by the marketplaces uh, or by the platforms in order to prevent the adoption of ambitious uh, legislation. And I would really like to one sentence on the WTO, where there is now a huge uh, a negotiation on e-commerce. Uh, it is very important that there be a change of mindset. Uh, trade policy should be a tool to enhance consumer well-being and consumer protection should not be seen as a barrier to trade. And we are far from that uh, shift of mindset. But I think it's an important message. One is the tool for the other. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate you being, um, being brief there. Thank you. Sorry to, to rush. Um, so I think we'd now like to, to turn to the questions that we think have been um, that we've been uh, coming in from the audience. So thank you for uh, for interacting. And, and Kathy, perhaps you could um, highlight some some questions from from the audience, and I'll um, I will uh, call for volunteers from the from the panel to take the, to take those questions on. Sure. I mean, there's one here about the um, EU Digital Services Act. Uh, so obviously, for Niels, um, what's the added value uh, when looking at enforcement actions? So that's um, and um, on product safety. Um, what should be the liability of platforms for unsafe products sold using their platforms? Because we heard earlier that uh, fines don't really do any good. So you know, what? How do you tackle the, the issue of liability of platforms? Maybe take those two and then. Yeah, so Niels, perhaps you could, if you could start us off, and then if, if anybody else is particularly keen, perhaps um, yeah. let me know in the chat or wave your hand. <laughs> sure. no, um, first, um, DSA and enforcement, uh, of course, a very important connection. The, the enforcement is key. If, if the laws cannot be applied, the, the provisions are drafted in a way that the obligations of the platforms are updated. Let's say it's still, as I mentioned before, we, we maintain the overall framework of the so-called e-commerce directive. This is amended by the DSA, so it's just an amending piece of legislation. But clearly, let's say that the provisions are, are clearer and um, it will be covered with very specific enforcement structures to make sure that the DSA is properly enforced. Um, on the second question of the liability, again, the, the DSA does not change fundamentally the existing liability of, of uh, platforms. Uh, the the um, uh, balance is maintained that we have. We are also looking into further legislation in Europe on, on um, liability in this area, in, including on, on, on AI. But regarding the, the um, specific liability of platforms, let's say the, the current balance is maintained. Is there anyone who wants to add any quick thoughts to Nils's excellent response there? I guess it may be, uh, maybe requires some careful reading into the Digital Services Act drafting, uh, which, uh, which we'd all like to catch Andrew. up on. Oh, please go ahead, Carlotta. Yeah, I'll t let, me, let me take a, a stab at this. So, I mean, Amazon uh, is supportive of regulations that protect customers. Uh, I think we've gone on record and said that a number of times. We also support the DSA and its aims and overall approach to maintaining a uh, successful limited liability regime. Uh, what our concern is, um, is the legal uncertainty that could be generated from the possible overlap between the Digital Services Act and the General Product Safety Directive. And so um, for us, what we think is it's really important is to uh, have a level playing field across all of retail. Um, and that's why having some of that embedded in the DSA is, is of some concern to us, as at least the way I understand it right now. Thank you very much. Um, are there some other questions, Kathy, yeah. that we'd like um, to turn there's to? A, another question here, which is, uh, how is consumer harm collated? And there's also one specifically um, about Australia. So uh, have you analyzed why there are higher costs for products in, in Australia for in-store over online marketplaces? Is it taxes or other costs? So how do you collate consumer harm and also why are prices different in Australia? Or oh, I'm sure well, everyone but that's specifically about Australia. So we'll perhaps come to, to, to James on that second question in a, in a moment, but perhaps um, um, Monique or Christine would, would like to have a, have a go at that first question on the collation of consumer harm. I just have a, a stupid question, collate, collate, can you give another word for that? Because uh, I'm not English native. 
how, how do you actually um, aggregate it all together and, and uh, I suppose, you know, build a picture, a full picture? I see Christine has raised her hand. Go ahead, Christine. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, that's actually a, a, a very uh, big problem. Um, there are um, so enforcers all around the world have got their own systems. Uh, very often, the systems of enforcers can be pretty reliable and solid. But what you find is that to catalog consumer harm and know where it's coming from, it's not just enforcers. So we're not just talking about public enforcement. We're often also talking a lot about private enforcement and consumers going to ADR or going to court. And that's where it becomes very complicated, uh, where there is no standardized way of um, being able to say that, for example, if we talk just about a scam that might not even have been subject of any action from a consumer, uh, the way they are uh, collected um, is not always the same. So mm -hmm. I looked at scams a, a while back and it's impossible to build a real picture and collate some figures overall because every country and then within countries, every type of enforcers might have a different system. So something that might be a online dating scam um, is uh, perhaps just um, online services and that's the category they get put in. So um, it's really hard then to, to go into the granular of, of what the problems are. So at the moment, um, from my experience, there is nothing really available. I know there's been some initiatives here and there to try and harmonize um, this, but it's still very difficult um, to do that. Yes, I mean, I, I, that certainly chimes with my, even, even within the UK, we have very different ways of collating um, and, and gathering and measuring consumer complaints. And that's even more difficult when you add in this issue about um, harmonisation and different rules across different jurisdictions. But yes, there are conversations happening within OECD and ICEPEN and UNCTAD around um, how, how we can move this forward, both in terms of public and private enforcement. Um, no, thank you, um, Christine. Um, Perhaps we could turn to, to James on this, um, uh, explaining the, the higher prices for consumer products in Australia, if that's not too uh, stereotypical or, or sort of uh, targeting uh, targeting you too much. No, that's fine. And I think this is, this is sort of a hot topic in Australia, and there's actually been parliamentary inquiries into this particular question. But as an online business that also operates as a retailer, I can speak to this from some experience. Australia is simply a high cost economy to do business. We have a high wage base, so we have a high minimum wage, but we also have high wages for um, retail workers. Um, we have expensive rents because land is cheap, because most, uh, I mean, land isn't cheap because um, most of the um, um, land on which you can live is along the coast. And I think about 85% 80, of the country is a desert that you can't really live in. Um, and the distance factor is another um, issue. So actually getting products to consumers is, ex is, is expensive. We're also generally seen as a high taxing economy. So there are um, issues related to um, sort of the cost of compliance um, in Australia that, that add to cost, but overwhelmingly it's, it's more to do with um, wages, distance and um, the issues around geography. Thanks very much. Um, There's just one question here specifically for Coletta from Amazon about uh, dispute resolution and the dispute resolution mechanism. Um, somebody writing a, a PhD, but I mean, it's still, it's very interesting because, you know, how many disputes do you approximately resolve? You may not know this Coletta, but is the negotiation phase fully automated or is a human involved? Because we heard how important humans uh, are in when uh, from catch in catch. Um, and how many disputes need intervention of a third party? You probably don't have the statistics for this, but just could sort of give us sort of sense of how you deal with, with dispute re res resolution. Yeah, um, it, it's a great question and I don't have the stats at my fingertips. It's not an area at Amazon that falls under my organization. But what I would talk about, I think briefly, if you haven't heard about it, is something that we call at Amazon the A to Z guarantee. So what the A to Z guarantee means is that you will in time get to a person, you will be able to talk through your issues. And it's just super simple. Um, it doesn't matter if a customer's bought something from Amazon or from a third party seller, um, Amazon's gonna ensure that the customer gets taken care of. Uh, and in the case of a third party seller, 
uh, if the third party seller won't cover the cost of the item and take care of the customer, Amazon will do that for the customer. Um, and I think that's maybe kind of a, a pretty general answer, but I think it's the protection and the foundation behind the, the intent of the question. Thanks very much. Maybe maybe time for one more question, Cathy? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I think so. I'm just, we're just getting messages on timing, but I think yes. we're until four o'clock. So um, let's have a look what else there is coming in. Um, and we've dealt with those ones. Uh, I think we've we've actually answered most of the most of the the questions that I can see here, because we've talked about coordination um, between mm. government and consumer regulatory bodies in in the mm. discussion. So, um, so I think we're we've sort of dealt with all the audience questions anyway. Well, that's that's excellent. Thank you very much for your help with that. Um, so, um, well, thank you um, to all the panelists very much for your um, well considered answers and your, your thoughts. It's been really great to hear from so many of you. Uh, and we've covered a huge amount of ground um, very quickly. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to um, to Cathy to, to sum up and um, lead us into uh, the, the next session. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And well, let's have a look at uh, Josh's drawings. Um, very hard to keep pace with so much being said at the same time. But um, I mean, we, we started off, uh, I mean, talking about the advantages, obviously, of the marketplaces. I love the fact that Carletti, you talk about Jeff, um, your CEO, just by his first name. There can't be many companies that you can do that, but we, we all know who you're talking about. Um, but we, we saw convenience and price and environment and, the, and also the, the range of products is the reason that people um, will go to the, to the platforms. But um, we heard from Monique from the consumer's perspective that uh, platforms are failing to take measures and self-regulation doesn't work. But then of course we hear that there is a lack of harmonized uh, enforcement rules around the world, which is a problem for, for the consumers. It's, it's confusing, but obviously the platforms themselves need this. Uh, Amazon wants it too, because it's, it's, it's confusing for everybody. Of course, there are attempts at the global recourse portal of the OECD, um, but as you know, and and other measures, of course. But the, but as Neil said, from the EU perspective, it's so difficult for the regulatory framework to keep pace with what's going on out there. So then, you know, great that there are initiatives being taken at, by the platforms themselves to to actually go sometimes beyond what the the, the law is is laying down. And then we heard about what the platforms are doing to a certain extent. I mean, we, you know, a catch in in Australia, the education for the sellers really important. But Niels has said that, you know, there are different traders all the time. So this is sort of the sense of, of, of trying to sort of renew this is very, very difficult. Um, and also it's not just about technology though, in terms of, of uh, enforcement and, and um, it, the human touch has to be there. And that's why the audits at Catch are done with real people, if you like. Um, but technology is important for things like predictive modeling of risk. Um, which is what, what is being done at Amazon. So there is a lot going on out there, but um, there's obviously a lot more coming with the Digital Services Act. And then this was where we hear from Monique, the most, diff most important thing when there's so many different bits of regulation being changed, that there isn't a, any regulatory gap that um, is going to really create problems in the future. Um, and particularly there needs to be a sort of stronger liability because paying fines is not enough. So let's have a look at, at um, Josh's uh, his drawing. Um, he talks about enforcement and, and enforcement obviously has always been a, a, a big issue when it comes to anything to do with consumer uh, policy. If the policy is there, you need, and we talked about it, somebody did mention the fact that the, the need to be, the enforcers need to be skilled up particularly if it's, we're talking about using technology, because that's a really, really important thing. Um, a lot of lobbying by platforms was said, and that's what, what Josh puts here on, on his uh, illustration. I think most of the things that I've just talked about, you've got on your, your this, this slide, and these slides are going to be made available on the, the website of the OECD and from for this event, so you can have a close look at them. Um, Josh, thank you so much. It must be incredible having to concentrate and get all this done in such a short time. 
So I'd like to thank all of our speakers for this session and for all the sessions today. We're meeting again at 12.30 CET tomorrow. So whatever time that is, wherever you are in the world. Um, and we will be talking about product safety, which is a big, big issue. I mean, uh, today, Monique said that 66% in the test they did um, of uh, products tested from online marketplaces fail safety checks, which is incredible, actually. That is a big statistic. Um, so we're talking about product safety and we're talking about consumers in the green economy. And we know that that has also become more important. We heard that today, how people are buying much more with sustainability in mind since COVID. So uh, it'll be very interesting to hear what happens in those sessions. So we'll see you at 12.30 CET tomorrow. See you then. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. <laughs>